Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, David Wright here, and I'm your host of the Disruptive Innovators Champions of Digital Business podcast. And this afternoon, I am joined by Rachel Lockett. Rachel, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, so Rachel, starting out, um, tell us a little bit about your current role, where you are now. Sure. Well, I'm currently serving as the Chief Information Officer for the Polad Companies in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Very cool. And um, we like to start our episode with one piece of actionable advice you'll look to give our listeners today. Okay. Well, I think the main thing that I'd love to share um, with everyone, and I'm actually writing a book about it, is that when it comes to technology management and leadership, the technology doesn't matter. It's all about the people in the process. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, Andy Lodato, uh, he's the COO of Vitamin Shop. He, he wrote a book akin to that. Um, I should connect to you guys. Do you have a title for the book yet? Now, that's what I was going to go with is the technology doesn't matter unless someone else already took it. I, I'll check and no. see. That's a great title. I'll, I'll be looking forward to that. Um, any, any time horizon yet or... Uh, Hoping to have it done by the end of the summer. Um, wow. Yeah. So I'll be able to say that's what I did over my summer vacation. That's very exciting. Congrats. Yeah. Thanks. Um, for sure. Well, so let's start by um, getting into a little bit of your personal backstory. Where did you start out? You know, how did you get to be the CIO that you are today? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know how far back you typically go, but I'll, I'll go back to high school. Why not? Um, actually, yeah. I wouldn't go back to high school for anything, but <laughs> that's, where, that's where it started. Um, I was going to be an actress. I was in theater and did all of the, the plays and, um, and in high school. And then at the end of my senior year, I just decided, you know, I don't think I want to do that as a career. I think I'd like to do something with a little more statistical probability of success and uh, realized that I was actually not bad at this uh, computer thing. Uh, my, my drama director and English teachers would actually have me help them out with computers uh, and teach their classes how to use them to write research papers. So I changed my mind at the last minute and decided to major in computer information systems. Um, started out as a programmer uh, and quickly moved into technology management. I became a supervisor and then an IT manager and then an IT director and uh, just really um, enjoy problem solving, uh, but especially leading and, and, and helping other people reach their potential within the technology realm. For sure. Very cool. Yeah, I, it's funny. I, I actually was passionate about technology as a kid. You know, I was like building computers and, you know, setting up local area networks. And then when I got into like the co college age and coming out of college, I was in New York and I was like, I want to go into finance because people in New York, you know, you make money, you go into finance. And That's what you do, right? I hated it. So <laughs> yeah, I well, came, came back around into technology. So. Well, but obviously you're leveraging some of that public speaking and, and broadcasting and in what you're doing now. Um, and it's a similar kind of thing for me. You know, I, I still am able to leverage my passion, which, you know, which is communication and, and, and public speaking. I'm one of those rare people that's not deathly afraid of it. Um, I'm able to leverage that within my role in technology. And so I don't know, you probably hear this a lot too, but often I'll hear, you're not like other IT people. Um, and I'm not. And, and, I, and I think that helps to uh, differentiate us within the field and, and, um, I attribute that to, to some of how I've gotten where I am in my career. Yeah, that well, that and it comes back to like that. Yeah, the acting background. I mean, that's huge because there's not a lot of CIOs that have that same, you know, kind of dual threat um, background. And right now, I feel that it's more important than ever, you know, when it comes to these complex business challenges that are facing, you know, so many organizations and, you know, being able to really translate the the impact that's having on the organization into what us IT le leaders know about solving for that and then kind of bridging that gap between the rest of the executive team, the board and the IT staff um, to really translate 
strategic directives into executable actions. Absolutely. It's critical. And and that's what I am talking about a lot in in this book is the fact that it's really about the interpersonal relationships and the communication. Um, I'm writing it sort of with two audiences. One is the IT leaders, maybe, you know, who are looking to grow in their career or, you know, maybe are, are kind of struggling with that side of things. And the other is to the business leaders. And the key message is, is learning how to talk to each other. I mean, a lot of people have written books about aligning technology with business. My approach on it or my, my advice is you really have to start with aligning the people before you can align the technology or, or the processes. Um, and so it's about understanding each other and talking each other's language, helping technology leaders know how to talk that, that business language and, and talk about technology as a strategic asset for the business in the terminology and, and the way that business leaders talk about it. And then on the flip side, yeah. helping business leaders understand how to, to uh, relate to their IT people. Just a, a thought. So, you know, you're aware, I'm sure, of the high turnover that we have in the technology industry, right? I mean, and huge, it's, huge problem right now. In such a huge gap, right? Such a huge you know, um, gap between the, the available professionals and the open roles. And I think there there's... I don't know. Have you have you seen a, a really good explanation for the reason why we have such high turnover? I mean, it seems to be um, an anomaly. There's a lot of other fields that are maybe highly technical or, or you know demand that higher skill set that don't have quite as high turnover. I believe that a huge part of it is that lack of ability to relate the business people and the technology people being able to talk to each other. I feel like that contributes to that to that high turnover that we see in IT. So my goal is to help those two sides talk to each other and better understand each other and work together and align themselves so that they can then align the technology strategy to the business strategy. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, it speaks to creating, uh, you know, I've seen that in certain organizations where there, there comes an IT leader who can do that within an organization and it creates this culture where you know, the IT team's excited. They're excited mm-hmm. to go to work. They're excited to be a part of the team. They're engaged. And they're appreciated by the, yeah, they're engaged, exactly. So. And those um, businesses gonna... have lower turnover rates in IT. I've seen them too. For I've seen sure. them where they get it right. They're able to hold on to people and create that team, that long lasting team. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I mean, already some great insight. I want to get, um, you know, not philosophical, but I want to I want to understand some of the most important things that you've learned over the course of your life. And, you know, what was life like before learning it? What was like life like after learning it? Maybe you could share. I think you'd probably have some interesting things to share with us. Sure. Yeah. So probably the biggest one, I've had this question a lot, so I've had a lot of opportunity to think about it. And I think the biggest, uh, you know, and it gets gets back to the whole theme. You know, that's what everything that, that I'll probably talk about will relate to, but it is developing the relationships with your peers. So if I'm if I'm a, a department head, right, I'm, I'm leading a department, I'm a manager, um, we all know we're supposed to be the coach for our employees, right? I'm the coach of my team. Well, early in my career, I perceived that as if I'm the coach of my team, then the department head of all of those other departments, they're the coaches of their teams. What are all of these coaches to each other? We're competing, right? We're competing for budget dollars. We're competing for our, you know, accolades and success, right? Wrong. That's what I learned. And that's what really changed everything for me is understanding that when it comes to teamwork in the workplace, yeah, I'm the coach for my team, but I'm a team member with my peers. So all of those other department heads, they're not my competition. They're my teammates. And I need to treat them like that. I need to set that example. And I need to work together with them, communicate proactively, understand what their needs are and what it is they're trying to accomplish so that I can play my role on the team and support them in their role on the team. That's probably the biggest learning from my career that I, that I hope to be able to share with others. Yeah. No, that's great, great insight, because that's one of the when we go into organizations, one of the the breakdowns that we see in regard to 
you know, optimizing workflow is that there, that lack of feedback loops between departments. And I mean, the, the impact that IT can have, if you're able to create those, um, that, that, that communication, like you're saying, is, is profound. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of cool things that can be done, but that, that communication definitely needs to be there. So, absolutely. Um, uh, and, and what about um, one of your biggest failures? And, you know, what did you learn from it? Biggest failures? Well, yeah, this is when I was looking through the questions ahead of time, this is one that I kind of struggled with. <laughs> there, there's plenty. There's not one that stands out as kind of the biggest among them, but um, I've had projects. We all have them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have had projects that have got, not gone well. Um, I think the projects in my experience that have have not been successful are the ones where maybe it was something that it was being driven by IT and we didn't have good business champions, you know, business leaders who were bought in and who were who were pushing for and driving for that change. Um, and I was too happy early in my career to take that on myself. I'll be responsible for it. I'll drive this. I'll ensure success. But you can't do that by yourself. IT can't can't do that in a vacuum. Um, yeah, sure. If it's something completely behind the scenes, we're upgrading a switch. Yeah, of course. But if we're talking about business facing technology, there has to be that business championship and that partnership. It can't just be IT driving it by themselves. So that was that's probably the source of most of my uh, uh, unsuccessful projects in my past. Sure. Yeah, that organizational change management, especially when you get into enterprise organizations like yours is, is so key. I mean, uh, especially with uh, organizations that are hev heavily involved in M&A activity and mm -hmm. you get into those projects and if you don't have those business leaders, you know, can get really hairy really quick. So that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, what about, um, let's shift gears uh, for a minute. Um, obviously you're writing a book, but what's one of your favorite books, blogs, or, or literary pieces right now? Uh, well, I'm not sure if you consider it a blog, but are you familiar with Blinkist? Yes, I'm, I, but I, I don't um, read it regularly. I love Blinkist. So Blinkist, uh, Blinkist is a subscription that um, what they do is they'll take management books. And I do, I love reading. I love management books, but I've got a lot of things going on, right? And so it's hard to, to devote the time to, you know, reading an entire book. And, and what I really want is just to get the key points out of it, just to get the salient message out of it. And that's what Blinkist does is they condense them down to, you know, 10, 15 minute uh, segments, little chapters that they call blinks. And so you can just get, it's almost like the cliff notes as an audio, you know, podcast, if you will. Um, and then, but from that, then you can decide which ones you want to invest the time to read the whole thing. Um, so the last thing that I read that was really great, um, the workplace you need now, of course, that was very timely as, you know, um, you know, through the pandemic, understanding how to design workplaces. We were building a building in a new office um, that we just moved into a couple months ago. So that was something really relevant. Um, and what I'm just starting is Brene Brown, Atlas of the Heart. So those are Big lovely. fan, big fan of Brene Brown in our house. She's fantastic. Um, yeah. I mean, I've I personally, I've found that um, emotional intelligence, vulnerability, like a bunch of the stuff that she talks about, I, I think is so important in business and has been looked over for so long, but, um, you really know, is. I've found that the more, yeah, the more that I can focus on and, and you kind of spoke to it before, but like creating actual human connection and, and really trying to, you know, just show up and see how you can be of service. And like all of that is, I mean, it's, it's profound. It's great. I mean, I, I, that's it's the kind of business I want to run at least. Absolutely. That's what leads to that engagement when you can show up as your whole self and, and everyone else can too. And you can, you know, learn so much from each other and just care about each other as human beings. And then, and then the effort you're putting into work isn't just to, you know, sell the widgets or, or whatever it might be, but it's to, to take care of everybody, to make sure that we're all getting opportunity and, and, and having that job security and job satisfaction moving forward. 
yeah, it's it's more fulfilling too for me as a as a business leader, as a employer, um, as a, a you know a, a consultant with clients because you know I'm not if I'm not if I'm coming from that place, I'm not coming from a place of fear where I'm fearing what uh, I'm going to lose or I'm fearing what I'm not going to get. Mm-hmm. You know, if I can just focus on you know, how I can help someone else, I can get outside of myself. And, and that abundance for me, mentality, right? That it's, it's right. not a zero sum game that we're, you know, we're creating this more opportunity for each other. Love that. So let's, let's get into a little bit about your current role. You're talking about that new building. So you're at Polad Companies. Um, let's talk a little bit about your, your vision for the organization and what you guys are up to. Sure. Well, I have a really great role um, with the Polad companies. I'm the, the chief information officer for the parent company. And the Polad organization is actually a group of fairly diverse businesses. Um, so we have commercial real estate companies. We have a custom engineering and robotics automation company. We have a group of luxury automotive dealerships. Um, around here, most people know, know the Polads because they own the Minnesota Twins um, and several other businesses, right? So for me, I get to be in charge of strategic technology leadership for this group of companies. And so I really get to focus on a couple of, of things that, are, that I'm very passionate about. Um, one is our digital transformation. And so for several years now, I've been leading these companies through the process of each of them independently creating their own digital business strategy and working through that. Um, the second, information security, of course, incredibly important. Um, so we worked together, all of the representatives from each of the companies to develop an information security standard and ensure compliance across all of the companies. And then the third area, my favorite, is leadership development. And really that extends to all of the technology staff and, and even beyond, helping to increase the digital dexterity of all employees across the organization. But I especially get to focus most of my time on mentoring and developing the technology leaders, um, both that that first tier of you know IT directors and IT managers and, and CIOs at the companies, um, as well as those rising stars and those up and coming leaders. And so that's that's really where my passion lies is in in technology leadership development. Wow, that's exciting. Um, so you know, normally at this point we we'd ask about some of the key initiatives that you're focused on. So either you know, as a as a parent organization, or maybe um, within one of your you know portfolio companies, if you will, what are what are some of the key initiatives that you're focused on right now? Well, most of our companies are focused on growth, and so um, several of them have uh, pretty ambitious digital transformation projects going on right now. Um, they're all different because they're in such different and diverse industries. Um, so one of my favorites that that's um, happening right now and just launched is our automotive dealership group. Uh, they just launched a an online, a purely online um, used car sales platform. Um, it's it's really the first of its kind in partnership with another industry leader to um, take the entire process and make it a, an online process up until they actually pull the car up into your driveway. So that's been a lot of fun to be part of um, to help with, you know, getting that ready to launch. And then I was, I was the fifth person to purchase a car through the site. So that was exciting. That's so cool. Is it a Porsche? No, sadly it's not. It was a used car for my son to take to college. <laughs> oh, I'm bummer. I noticed on the website, you guys had a lot of Porsche uh, dealerships, but still we cool do. nonetheless. I mean, more, I mean, in every industry really, um, you know, lately it's been, We've had a lot of conversations with healthcare leaders and um, financial institution leaders about how we need to make this user experience radically convenient and highly personalized. And it sounds like that's kind of in that that vein, you know. Um, and that's in my experience, other than you know creating operational efficiencies and you know financial incentives for organizations, obviously. Um, you know, creating that customer experience is so crucial right now. I mean, COVID really, really pressed the issue, right? Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so. another one of our businesses, their digital transformation has been about taking the the um, commercial real estate loan, origi- 
loan origination process from about a 60 day process down to seven days or less. Um, so a really ambitious goal there. But again, all about the customer experience and that process for them, for the customers. Um, so it's very exciting to be part of those transformations and see radical change in an industry like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, I mean, you, you have these exciting initiatives going on. What are some of the biggest challenges you guys are, are facing right now? I know we touched on, you know, attrition earlier that I know that's some of the topics I hear about, but what are some of the biggest challenges you guys are facing? Yeah. I mean, uh, finding and retaining talent, you know, and um, even when outsourcing, outsourcing vendors are having the same challenges. And so we're having those same kind of struggles, even if, you know, even if we're trusting a, a vendor partner, they're having high turnover. It's, it's really challenging right now. And that's why I feel like the only way we're going to be successful in realizing all of these ambitious technology goals, and I mean worldwide, is if we have that focus on the people and the process, and especially on building those relationships and and you know managing that and, and helping to broker that strengthened uh, collaboration between the business and technology, and and so that's where I'm. I want to put my time and my energy right now because I think that's the key to our success. It's smart. I mean, I, I've had to invest extra time, you know, really connecting with my people, making sure they feel valued. Um, connecting with our consultant partner, everybody really. Um, gave, David, gave do you the, raises. Do you, have you ever run into the business leaders who kind of, they tend to walk into every room or every conversation with an IT person and they're already apologizing for not being technology savvy. They're the ones telling, oh, I, I don't, I don't know anything about what you guys are, are talking about. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure you're, you're doing great, but I, I don't get this technology stuff. You've met those kind of people, right? Yeah. Of course that's that's the the business leaders that i want to talk to and i want to i want to help them understand that you got to stop doing that first of all it's you know you probably got this thing in your pocket where you know you're checking your account balance and you're changing your thermostat and you're uh, you know looking up your step count for the day and you get technology you don't have to keep right. apologizing and, and you know saying that you don't but also just help them understand that that's creating this divide it's creating this wall between you and your technology team that isn't necessary because like i said in the beginning technology management isn't about the technology it's about good business management it's about the people and it's about the process and yeah you need to have technologists with those skills and with that background um, and you need to trust them to do what they're good at, but you don't have to be intimidated by it. Uh, and I and I think that's part of what it is. I think a lot of times business leaders are they're in intimidated by you know just IT in general by maybe afraid of of looking like they don't know something or you know looking foolish or I mean I've heard many of them say oh you know they make me feel dumb because you know they explain things up here. And that's input for us. That's important for us as IT people to learn and understand how to communicate more effectively with them. But I think the right. business leaders also need to understand that, you know, that, that getting over that and, and sort of tearing down that wall is really key to their business success. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think it was easy for many years because IT was so siloed. You know, it was, it mm -hmm. was you know, over here for many businesses, at least, and it, it existed to kind of in the shadows, you know, I, I, there's so many organizations I go to where like IT was like in the basement, like yep. tucked away, like Robert, in the yeah. corner. <laughs> they, they, we keep them down in the basement and they just have to feed the hands <laughs> to keep the servers running. Right. Right. <laughs> We're not um, there anymore. We are out in front of the customers and we have, we have to step up and the business also needs to recognize that that's where we need to be. And, and give, you know, allow their technology leaders that seat at the table and that involvement and, and understand it's cliche now, but understanding that every business is a technology business. Well, especially in certain industries where the, the like healthcare, for example, not to go up there again, but like an understanding of like the clinical and operational workflows from someone who's not necessarily technologically savvy, that right. input when it comes to designing technology solutions is invaluable and totally necessary to really add maximum value. And that's relevant to so many different industries. 
Absolutely. And that's where we can help those business leaders see it. It doesn't matter that you don't know how to how to write code or how to harden a server. Right. It, that doesn't matter. You're still a critical part of the technology design and implementation process. And so step into it. Come on, help us out. We got to do this together, right? I love that. Um, so what are some of the best practices you and your, your team follow? Um, well, uh, I, let's take it back to communication, right? Um, I think uh, making sure that we have regular check-in, you know, touch points with business leaders and, and subject matter experts. Um, you know, especially if I'm working with a technology leader that's kind of struggling, um, you know, maybe their their department has a bad image, a bad reputation. You know, maybe they're known for putting the no in innovation. Uh, a lot of that can be solved not by bringing in some great new technology, but just by having good communication and, and building, strengthening those relationships with their peers. So that's something that that I hold my IT leaders accountable to. And, and if it's really a challenge for them, we'll get super specific and we'll list out the people and we'll put it on a spreadsheet. And, you know, you need to meet with this person once a month or this person, maybe we're in a bad shape. We need to meet with them once a week um, and, and just really holding them accountable to that. Um, so that's that's one best practice is really being intentional about that proactive communication with the other business leaders, with your peers. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. Um, we've had, we've had a lot of projects where, you know, co communicating even with with field personnel and really enrolling them and, and get it, continually getting feedback. I mean, it's been uh, crucial to the success of a project and. Um, you know, so much of the perceived success of a project is all the users using the solution successfully and, and being, you know, excited and happy about the solution. So like that communication is so important. I mean, otherwise, you know, the project is not a success. I mean, even yeah. if you roll it out successfully, it's, it's just not, I mean. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You can have, you can have the newest, best, you know, most proven, most expensive technology in the world. But if you don't get the people and the process part, you know, the organizational change management that you mentioned earlier and, you know, the ongoing training and education and communication and, uh, you know, just bringing people on board with the concept, if you don't get all of that right, it's going to fail. Yeah. Um, we talked about uh, the 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 portal that the used car dealership uh, is coming out with. Very cool. Um, any other innovative technologies that are supporting the business vision of any of the other portfolio companies that you're working on that you're excited about? Sure. I mentioned that one of our um, businesses is the Minnesota Twins, Major League Baseball team. And they are, they're a lot of fun to work with because they take the off season to every year to do something new and innovative with the ballpark or with the technology that they're using. And so they've always got really cool stuff going on. Um, lately, a lot of the focus is around data analytics. Um, they've been doing you know, a little bit with things like facial recognition and artificial intelligence and things like that. Um, they're also replacing their scoreboard, which was already huge, the size of a basketball court, but uh, scoreboard 2.0 is coming along. So they've, they've taken a whole huge room and, and made it the new control center for the scoreboard. So there's always something innovative and exciting happening with the twins. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably our most innovative group within the organization. That's, that's really cool. I mean, it's cool that you guys, you know, own the Minnesota twins and then it's cool to hear what you guys are doing with, with AI and facial recognition and data. I mean, when you talk about like a consumer organization with where consumers are, are paying for tickets and in doing so, you know, they, I don't want to say sign away certain, you know, uh, or, or they agree to, you know, their data being part of, you know, the twins kind of repertoire. Sure. Um, so much you could do with that data, yeah. right? I mean, it's so yeah. cool. Um, and you mentioned the creating... effects of the pandemic. Um, I think this is probably not unique just to the twins, but they've really come so far in things like, you know, being able to order your food 
at your seat using the ballpark app and, and having it delivered to your seat and, and things like that um, to help, you know, create that fan experience. They also um, recognize that, you know, just interest in baseball, you know, their, their fans are aging and they're having a hard time kind of getting the newer fans interested. And so the Minnesota, the Minnesota Twins actually partnered with um, another organization to do an accelerator program, uh, Techstars. Uh, so they um, had applicants of, you know, different startups and they chose 10 uh, startup companies that that we would mentor. I was part of the process and got to serve as one of the mentors for the program. Um, but, you know, kind of create that incubator, that startup incubator for them. And so we've taken one cohort through the process and now we're starting up um, the second cohort. There'll be three altogether. So 30 companies in total. And in the application process, we're specifically looking for companies at that intersection between sports, entertainment and technology. Um, looking for those companies that are helping to create the future of sports entertainment. Um, so that's been a really exciting thing to be part of. Yeah, that is, that is super cool. That's super cool. Um, and that kind of leads into some of our, our final questions actually. Um, and we could stay on, on the twins or, or, um, we can go kind of any direction you want, but, um, cause typically we ask, where do you see the industry? you know, your industry going into the future and you're obviously involved in multiple different industries. So, I mean, um, I, I would say ch choose any of them and, and just, um, what do you think, uh, will be the kind of some of the biggest changes as time passes in one of those industries? Well, I don't consider myself, you know, kind of one of those, um, there are people, futurists, who are who really do seem to have the crystal ball and, and can see so much further out on the horizon. But as I said, my my interest, my focus is really a lot more on the people. And so, you know, that's what I see is I think it's going to we're going to continue to have to work really hard to attract and retain good people. I think we need to put more effort into encouraging um, young people. Um, especially women and people of color to go into technology fields, um, help them see that it's yep. a, a really rewarding career, um, that it can be so much fun. Uh, you know, it's not that typical stereotype like we were talking about hiding in the basement and, you know, just keeping the server running, right? Uh, there's so much more to it and it's very exciting, but there's a lot of work that we need to do um, in order to get people engaged. I, I, again, I think there's so much work to be done to help um, bring about that technology and business alignment on the human side of it, right? Not just the technology side of it. Uh, and so I think that's where we need to put our efforts. And I, I hope that we'll continue to see improvement. I think a lot of the efforts, you know, the businesses are putting a lot of effort into their diversity and inclusion initiatives. I hope that will help help us within the IT realm as well, obviously um, an area where we have a lot of room for improvement there. So I hope that will help us create this um, this sort of new image and an identity of the technology field um, as we move yeah. into the future. I love that. And I feel like we should nominate you to be like our president or something of the, the, the new technology order. Um, <laughs> you know, I think you'd, you'd be good for that role. Wow, thanks. Um, <laughs> gonna yeah, I know. You, I mean, you say I... saying all the right things. I love it. Uh, I, I could see it. I could see the future of, of uh, and it is about the people. I mean, it will always be about the people. Um, more well, so, so now many than of ever. the problems, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wax even more philosophical for you here now, David. So many of the problems that we have in the world, I think, can be solved with technology. And I'm not going to get into specifics and certainly not going to wade into politics, but uh, you know, I have a, I have a son You're who's right, 19 though. and he'll come to me with a current event, you know, situation and he'll say, you know, well, these people think this and these people think this and which one is right. And, and oftentimes I'll say, well, we have the technology to be able to do this, <laughs> to, so, to, to not just solve or pick a side, but to eliminate the problem. Why aren't we doing that? I do believe that technology can solve so many of the problems that we face. Not not everything perfectly, but it can really help us make huge improvements. Um, and I and I think we have to work through the people in the process side of it so that the technology can rise to its potential um, and help us. I'm get really sappy here, but help us create a better world for everyone. 
Is that too much? No, hundred percent. Not at all. I mean, I, we're, I'm working on a, another software platform that is in this vein. It, it measures enterprise organizations alignment with the UN sustainability goals and, you know, tracks their progress as they make improvements and, yeah. um, we'll have links into social media and, and really, I mean, and we're going to have a personal app too, that tracks our alignment with the sustainability goals. But when I think about what you were saying before, I think about like from a global standpoint, the impact that technology could have the impact yeah. that enterprise organizations could have if they invested in. in All right. I'll take a risk and wade into one little topic here. You know, we, we've, we have challenges with, um, officer involved shootings, right? And that's a big problem and everyone's trying to figure out what's the right thing to do. We have the technology to almost eliminate those because so many of them start with what? Traffic stops. Between self-driving cars, camera technology, all of those things, we should have eliminated traffic stops by now, right? And right. If, we could, if we could figure out, yeah, there's ethical questions to figure out when it comes to um, you know, when you're observing people and, and, you know, the facial recognition and all those kind of things, um, there's things we have to figure right. out in, in terms of the, the laws and the regulations and how are we going to decide, you know, if the vehicle is going to choose to hit a tree or a person, you know, there's all kinds of issues to figure out, but the technology is there to solve so many of those problems. If we can just get through the people in the process part. Yeah. No, I love that. And it, it, creating that accountability, even at, at a, at a higher level would, I think, have an impact on that. And I love the smart cities, you know, that would be a whole nother, you know, mm -hmm. hour or two, but Mark Wheeler in Philly, he's doing some really cool stuff, um, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, but, uh, we're almost up on time here. Um, it's been, it's been so great to have you, Rachel, our final question. We like to ask our guests is if you could go back five or 10 years, what advice would you give your younger self? Oh, can I go back further than that? <laughs> I, yeah, of course. Okay, I'm just going to go back all the way to the beginning and just, uh, oh, I would, I would, I would hand myself the book I'm writing and say, learn these things sooner because you can just make more progress faster. And again, it's all about, it's all about the relationships. It's understanding that my peers are not my competition; they're my teammates. It's understanding the importance of those personal connections. Um, and it's understanding that, you know, everybody that I work with is dealing with challenges. We're all, uh, you know, we, we're all facing some kind of, of persecution or, you know, um, some kind of stressor or something that's holding us back. And um, if we can help each other with that and, and understand one another better, we can all move forward together. I love that. And I, I really do love what you said about like the peers, because I don't think that's talked about, you know, as much as it needs to be. And like, it starts with me, right? It starts, you're clearly a champion of it. But like, if I'm an IT leader, like I need to, I need to reach out my hand and be that example so that other people can step into that reality. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's great that there's people like you leading the charge. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Um, and this ends our episode. Um, thank you. And uh, everyone, we'll, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, David. It was a pleasure.